Greetings and good afternoon. What a powerful way to start our session, watching Martha Red Rabone perform drums at the 2018 Folklife Festival Sister Fire concert. Thank you to Roadwork for collaborating with us. My name is Julia Loisa Gutierrez Rivera. I am a community engagement manager at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. I am also a dancer and a teacher of Afro-Puerto Rican traditional expressions. I am my parents' daughter, I am my elders, I am my ancestors, I am my community. Real-time captioning and ASL interpretation are being provided for today's program. To access these services, please follow the links in the comments below. We recommend that they be opened in a separate browser window or on a separate device alongside the event broadcast in order to view the program simultaneously. I'd like to welcome everyone today to this week's Smithsonian Folklife Festival Story Circle titled Arts of Change, Resistance, and the Common Good. Today's session is slightly different as it was duly prompted by a national conversation that is currently echoing through our streets. Today, we return to our foundation, the roots of the Folklife Festival, as we turn to the voices of artists who come together in frank and open reflection and dialogue on how they and we as creatives and cultural bearers channel despair, inspiration, and transformation. We hope that by turning inwards and towards our essence, we can then think outwards towards this outlook of change and transformation. But first, a few words. Earlier this week, the Secretary of the Smithsonian, Lonnie G. Bunch, released a statement addressing the travesty and outrage felt by thousands across this country as a result of the murder of George Floyd, the latest of countless injustices committed to our communities and people of color. In his statement, the Secretary said, although it, be, it will be a monumental task, the past is replete with examples of ordinary people working together to overcome seemingly insurmountable challenges. History is a guide to a better future and demonstrates that we can become a better society, but only if we collectively demand it from each other and from the institutions responsible for administering justice. As I read his statement, we were getting ready to launch an event for today, one that explored movement and the beauty and strength behind dance and Brazilian expressive culture. 
It was not lost on me or my colleagues that this discussion, one centered on celebrating the preciousness of our bodies, the strength of our black bodies, and the resilience of our breath, was poised to happen while at the same time, just outside of our homes, on our streets, thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of bodies, black, brown, and more, have been taken to the streets for over a week. Yes. Perhaps this was an important conversation to have today as it could have very well helped to counteract a dominant narrative that has been quick to condemn the volatility and rage of our communities, those our collective body taken to the streets to move, to breathe, to yell out in justifiable anger and grief. And still, we have paused. With a deep inhale, we breathed in the angst and exhaled a clear understanding that the conversation we need to have first is a different one. One that holds us as individuals, cultural producers, and as practitioners accountable to the sensibilities, sensitivities, and struggles of the communities we say we represent. We ask now, how can we use our voice, our breath, and our privilege as creative thinkers, as practitioners, and as change makers to freely move in these contexts to uphold resilience, strength, and broaden the conversations being put forward. We will have our original intended discussion, but at a later date. Because what rings truer now and echoes Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s the fierce urgency of now is for us to simply hold breath for and open a space for these burning conversations, to try to stay true to our mission of amplifying those voices that have already been speaking for so long, the voices of our ancestors, and those of our contemporaries. Today, it's for George Floyd. Yesterday, it was Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Philando Castile, Sandra Bland, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, and on and on and on. Tomorrow, who will it be? We shall breathe on behalf of them and on behalf of those who continue becoming casualties of this insidious and systemic struggle. This is not only our burden, it is our responsibility. And with that, we take deep breaths. Now, we talk. Today's session is hoped to be an open and fluid conversation. And as with all dialogues, none of this can happen alone. So I'd like to welcome a few brothers and a sister in art and thought, an inspiring group of cultural warriors whose work, whose lives and experiences have all been dedicated to using creative agency to speak and help amplify those voices of many others. Their roads have been long shaped by many accomplishments and they've broken many barriers. Please make sure to read their full bios in the comments of this session. First, I'd like to welcome Kojo X. Johnson. Good Hello. morning, Kojo, good afternoon. Good morning, good morning. <laughs> Julia, I will just awesome. oh. read a little bit of your bio so folks know how amazing you are. Um, Kojo was born and raised in Washington, DC. He's a Mestre of Capoeira, a musician, educator, researcher, and community organizer with more than 15 years coordinating arts enrichment, education, and other projects across the United States, Caribbean, Brazil, and South Africa. He is one of the first four African Americans to be officially recognized as a Capoeira Mestre by the founding Mestres of the International Capoeira Angola Foundation, or FICA, and has been leading efforts to document the 30 year historical and cultural contributions of FICA at its home at the Emergence Community Arts Collective, ECAC, on DC's U Street Corridor as part of the Remembering You Project. From our DC backyard, an activist, a mentor, working on so many crossroads and intersections. Kojo, it's great that you are able to join us today. It's an honor to be here. DC, stand up. That's right. Next up, Maria Isa Perez Hedges. Maria Isa is a singer, songwriter, actress, rapper, activist, youth organizer, and recording artist born in Minnesota and raised in St. Paul's West Side Barrio. She was raised by the influences of many different rhythms of Afro-Latino indigenous culture and has channeled those into performing arts and activism from a very early age. 
She has studied with master musicians, including Los Pleneros de la 21, Viento de Agua, Mila Lauger, and more whom all have influenced her to develop her Afro-Latinx and hip-hop lyricism performance style. Maria Isa is the recipient of the 2019-2020 McKnight Fellowship for Musicians. And since 2009, she has served as CEO for her independent Soda Rico label. Maria Isa has performed with countless top artists, including Bad Bunny, The Roots, Wu-Tang Clan, and more. And honestly, there's a lot more that I can say about this woman right here but I'm sure she's gonna share that much better than I can. So please welcome Maria Isa. Love, gracias. I'm honored to be a part of this conversation with all of y'all's forces and powers of the ancestors. Yes, yes. And last but not least, acting as our compass for today's discussion is Mark Gonzalez. Um, Mark is a futurist. He develops tools, tech, and narratives to ignite civic imagination and shape human existence. He is the chair of the Department of the Future and a 2019-2020 Kennedy Center Fellow of the Citizen Arts. With 20 plus years of experience spanning over a dozen countries, his pathway has included connecting artisans, investors, and urban planners to tell the future story of space pairing kidly creators with architects to create more child-inclusive cities, convening public trust tables disguised as dinner table conversations, and more. It's our blessing and privilege to have you joining us today, Mark. And with that, I'll send it off to you. Thank you. Uh, saludos, salam alaikum, hello to all uh, tuning in, and thank you for being here, and thank you for being alive to join us in this moment. Uh, I would actually like to start uh, with a question uh, to everyone. Uh, often in these types of gatherings, we're often asked to speak directly to our art, uh, or direct to our culture, or direct to our practice. Um, but not so much to who we are and how we arrive uh, to the places that we live in and we uh, operate in. And so with that, and perhaps you could, uh, whoever wants to kick it off, if you will, um, if you could just answer a simple question, which is where and when were you born? And what are the places you call home now? And I'll stress to the audience that we say home versus from, uh, which has a lot of loaded connotations to many of us uh, who've grown up in areas but have often uh, asked to prove that we belong there. Uh, or also the idea that one cannot only be from one place when many of the people on this call actually have many families, maybe many identities, and maybe even many commitments. Uh, so whoever wants to lead with the conversation, uh, we'll start with that question. Bueno, uh, okay, I'll start. Um, again, I'm Kojo, um, son of the Chocolate City. I should say, maybe I should say formerly the Chocolate City, Washington, D.C. Um, you didn't say when. I was I was born in the 60s. I was born in 1967 in D.C. So I aged myself right up front. But um, I call uh, a number of places home. I think most recently, St. Croix in Puerto Rico. Uh, for a number of reasons, uh, one of which is just, I don't know if you've ever been somewhere and you just feel like you've been there before, you feel like you belong there, but the people just mm -hmm. embraced me with so much love and, uh, and, and both Puerto Rico and St. Croix. And then there's a synergy between those two islands, uh, places like Ghana, my ancestral home, and uh, Bahia, Brazil, which is over the last gosh, 30 something years become my, uh, a, another anchor for me where, of course, is the home of Capoeira. What, <clears throat> where I call home, where I was born, where I call home, where I was born was in Hennepin County's St. Louis Parks, Methodist Hospital and taken immediately after my mother was released to the barrio, the first Latino barrio in the state of Minnesota, the west side of St. Paul. Um, home to me is the Twin Cities, St. Paul, Minneapolis, 
uh, the cities of Prince and the Revolution. Um, home to me is Sota Rico, is the Boricua community that has migrated here and raised children of the young lords to children of Santurce, Vega Baja, Ponce, Ajuntas, Fajaldo, Loisa, in the frozen tundra of the home state, Minnesota, the land of the Anishinaabe, Dakota, Ojibwe, the land where we say Magwitch to our tribes for sharing this beautiful land that has raised me and also shared their stories of resistance and unifying how we braid together. Um, home for me is where the heart and pulse of this revolution of 2020 has started. Home for me are the clubs and the stages that the late brother George Floyd protected. Home for me is the communities of the Somali refugee children that I work with among the Cambodian, Vietnamese, Mexicanos, Salvadoreños, Colombianos. Home for me is the two rivers that unify us. Home for me is Borinquen. Home for me is every barrio that plays bomba drums is where the heart is and that's where home is for me. Ooh. I mean, whoever didn't think that you were a lyricist really believes that now, that was beautiful. <laughs> right. um, as I said earlier today, my name is Julia Loisa Gutierrez Rivera and it's important for me to say my full four names because that is really what defines my home. My home is where my family is. Um, Puerto Rican, New York Rican, Diaspora Rican. I was born and raised in New York, born in Harlem Hospital on five o'clock afternoon, rain all throughout the day. Um, and it was interesting because I think that that was the foreground to, to lead a pathway into being a bombera and being a plenera, which are Afro Puerto Rican traditions cemented on a spirit of resilience, resistance, protest and empowerment. And that's a path that's often led with a lot of fire and energy. So it's very important to be walking that with water and coolness. As I said, born and raised in New York, home, many places. As Maria stated so eloquently, yeah, it's on the stages where I have the privilege to share the amazingness of our cultural expressions, the beauty that our ancestors had imparted unto us, to many people that probably would not have even thought of what is Puerto Rico, what is Latino, what is Afro-Latino, right? Mm -hmm. And we can represent that with our bodies, with our skin, with our sound, with our drums. Um, literally, uh, right now, home is also the DMV, Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia. Um, it's an honor to form part of Chocolate City. Kojo, thank you for your city for welcoming me. Um, and actually today, June 4th, marks uh, the first year, the anniversary of my starting my official journey with the Smithsonian Folk Life Festival. So it's a lot of um, confluences coming together. Wondrous, thank you. and. Uh... I will just add in a little bit, which is my name is Mark Gonzalez. Uh, there's the old saying of home is where the heart is. And I think in this moment where so many of us uh, think of home in terms of passport or where we pay taxes, uh, I'm reminded how many of us have families and children across borders and across nations and across communities. Uh, and for us then home is not singular. And I think we are a generation and a planet that is proving that, uh, even though sometimes our societies and laws are, are terribly behind what we are actually living. Uh, but I spent the last uh, nine weeks trying to get across three continents to my children uh, because of the COVID shutdowns across the world, um, from the borders to the airports. Uh, and for me, home is wherever they're at. Uh, I missed my second year old or my, my daughter's uh, two year old's birthday. 
which greatly pained me. And I was like, I'm not going to miss my five-year-old turning six at the end of next month, uh, even if it requires sleeping in an airport at times. Um, and so, and that it's, we do what we do, you know, to get to the people we love and we do what we do in order to protect and to support the people we love. That's and right. I think in this moment, you know, when both George Floyd, you know, was denied breath uh, by a police officer putting his uh, knee on his neck for a span of eight minutes and 45 seconds, when most of us can't even hold our breath for 30 seconds, mm -hmm. um, that if we think about that and we think of Eric Gardner before that, when if we think of Breonna Taylor, and as you mentioned, Sandra Bland, when we think of Trayvon Martin, and we think of Mike Brown, and the names can go on and on. I think that one, I just wanted to remind everyone that we're having this conversation because we're thinking about the people we love mm -hmm. and how do we better take care, protect and preserve the people we love and specifically the black people we love in our lives uh, in this moment to really look at what would it mean for culture, creativity and art to not only defend uh, black lives, but to also affirm them. Uh, in the spaces of black joy and black excellence and so many other things. Uh, so with that, I actually wanted to open up a different conversation, which is many of you uh, on this call, you know, practice capoeira. Uh, you've had uh, the conversation of Bombak just kept on coming up yesterday and today. And it's interesting to me that in uh, the title of this group, it very much refers to art and the art of change. Uh, but Kojo, yesterday you mentioned really something I think was powerful, which is we often think of art as spectacle, mm -hmm. you know, versus our practice is a lifestyle. And I think these are very different things from when we show up at a place to have an entertainment moment and we show up to a place to have a deep a commitment and almost a communion, if you will, with culture. And so uh, perhaps Kojo, if you could kick off that from what did you mean by that in terms of how can we do more lifestyle and less spectacle? And then maybe Maria and Julia after that, if you could join in as well, is what are the ways you've seen that done well in the spaces you operate in? Can you, can you say the last part again? What are the ways I've seen it done well? Yeah, what are, uh, so one is that how can we do culture more as lifestyle and less as spectacle? And then to even think about what are the places you've seen that happen in, you know? Has that been done well? Or are we trying to, to do something that has not yet been done? Well, I, I think we've, I guess I'll start backwards. I think we've, we've seen a lot, a lot of positive examples uh, here in the US through hip hop, uh, through dance, uh, you know, definitely through music. Uh, I speak to you as a capoeirista, obviously, and uh, as a practitioner of capoeira Angola, uh, uh, you know, I came up in the early days of GCAP in the city, Grupo de Caporangola Pelourinho, who really exposed me to the idea of culture as not just a spectacle, but as a vehicle, you know, not just as something to watch. You know, it's a very Western thing where you have the audience and you have the participants and the audience sits there very coldly and watches, you know, the performer. But, and uh, I'm so glad to have these sisters on here from other African diaspora cultural representations because in our cultures, be a bomba, capoeira, you know, African dance, plena, uh, I could go on. It, it's it's not about the, there's the audience and then there's the 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 the, the, the artist, the the community. We're, we're, it's a synergy between performer and and observer. You understand? So that's already that barrier is already non-existent, but. Um, what I've learned, I think, in my trajectory as, a, as, a, as part of FICA, uh, studying under Mr. Cobra Mansa, uh, people like Mr. Moraes, uh, Mr. Valmir Damasceno of uh, Salvador, Mr. Jurandji, uh, uh, Nascimento of, of Belo Horizonte, it really, they really showed me how you can take culture and engage people around pertinent issues, issues that are pertinent to them and give them uh, a certain amount of solace. Let them know that, you know, I see you. I understand that the, the issues you're going through. And, and really build, uh, give them a vehicle for expressing themselves and, and really uh, with young people build that self-esteem and build that cultural esteem, you know, 
I don't, I don't mind saying most of the African diaspora, most of the black diaspora, you know, wasn't necessarily cool to be black or identify with being black or being African, mm -hmm. but um, we in, instilled in, in young in, in young black uh, and black youth the idea that this is is a you know you have a proud ancestry you come from a beautiful and powerful ancestry uh, yours is not a story of victimhood but of resilience uh, fast forward to the present context I think that's a really important lesson you know we're not victims <laughs> we're not we're not victims this is a, this is a story about resilience and resistance and that's where um, this is this is uh, that that's 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 my experience with it. That's that's where I come to it. And, but there, there's so many examples all across the world. It's, it's become the norm, really, in the world of capoeira. You know, capoeira is being used as a vehicle to to uh, draw attention to certain uh, issues and to mobilize people and to you know give voice to the voiceless, to reach out, or reach uh, out to communities that uh, have been ignored and marginalized. And really uh, empower them through, through this vehicle as things we call culture, big C and little C. Mm -hmm. Wondrous. Thank you so much. And uh, let's go to Maria next. I will also say to our viewers turning in, if there's questions you have for anyone on this panel, for all of us, or even that's just in your heart at this moment that you want to lift up to the world, uh, please feel free to drop it in uh, the chat and comments, and we'll try to get to it towards the end. Whew. Um, right there with you, Brother Kojo, you know, um, as a child of Bomba, you know, or in plena, uh, what has allowed me to have self-esteem since I was a child was connecting with our ancestors' communication through those rhythms and having, you know, being blessed to have the parents in the community of village to let us know of who we are and not to lose that identity of being proud of ourselves and recognize our history that wasn't taught in these textbooks, especially not having, you know, such a strong uh, predominant community here in Minnesota, you know, like El Barrio or Humboldt Park in Chicago, uh, having to fight even more for our spaces um, and through this ra this these racial injustices. I was, you know, born and raised in Minnesota and schools were a lot different for me. The population, being the only Puerto Rican, being the only brown girl in, trying to advance in other programming to bring back to our communities uh, was very, is very challenging still as a woman and a mother. Um, bomba is my weapon and my best weapon of peace. It really is. And that's what I try to teach these children, not just Boricua children, but anybody who feels those drums, those rhythms, feel their identity, feel their resilience to be saying, this is how we change the poisons of the world into medicine. This is, this is what our ancestors left us to keep fighting. Mm -hmm. um, our drums, I, that song that you opened up with was so powerful because that's been my connection to feel more of a unification with the native brothers and sisters that have grown up on this land. You know, my mother came from New York City as a, as, as, as a young lord to work with the Mexican migrant workers that were here and the next generations to the indigenous folks that are fighting for their land, to the black unification of black and brown of saying, we have to recognize our own racial, you know, disparities in our Latino communities when it comes to being black and have these discussions amongst our families just as much as we are in these circles of what Minnesota nice wants to, that nice word is, is it's been Minnesota horrible our whole life. There ain't been no nice, you know, yeah. I, I wrote a song when I was 18 years old saying, Minnesota nice, quitate la mascara, take the mask off, because it ain't nice. Those mm -hmm. smiling faces of, mm -hmm. of telling us, you know, our leaders weren't leaders. I remember them saying that you get activist week as a kid, saying you made up a, a woman named Lolita Lebron. I mean, there wasn't Google back then, you know. Uh, Maria, yeah. this is nonsense. Mm -hmm. And that was, as a kid, mm -hmm who's your mother calls you Lolita, you know, like that, that was heartbreaking. That's like somebody saying, you know, to the sister that Asada Shakur is fake, that Angela Davis is fake. And they, they try to break our history, but when we have our centers, 
that are that are led by our elders that that have been these safe zones and spaces through the practices of bomba, plena, capoeira, you know, and in and, and, and inviting other cultural rhythms and other folks to say, share what you know from your ancestors and your survivors so we can all, you know, vamos comer todo junto, let's eat. It's, it's not about your oppression, their oppression. This is a systemic colonized world that we all are living and breathing for our grandparents. Mm. Um, people are going, times are so hard, times are so hard. And yes, trust me, man, the names that you have mentioned and some that you haven't, I've known who were killed by the police, you know, um, here in our cities. And the way that we've been able to continue to grow and even give birth has been through those rhythms of bomba. And now within this COVID and being trapped to not have those spaces to go to, it's even more important to remind ourselves that the space is where the drum is. And we have technology. Our ancestors didn't have a way to communicate with that's their right. primas across or that's, that's a privilege that we have to utilize as a tool in this time of resistance. Mm -hmm. You know, we can do healing a bomba with Julia letting us know what's up in a, in a FaceTime or Evie Lee's doing her Escuelita de Bomberas and with all the heart that they give out of their homes, you know, mm -hmm. like, and that's what the fuel is mm -hmm. yeah. to keep us going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that can be said. Um, you know, the, the question of performance and performing, especially when we talk about uh, cultural practice, uh, heritage expressions and things that we do in honor and service of our ancestors is, is a really um, charged question, right? Um, I think and I would hope that being on a stage is a platform that we can use and recognize as a blessing so that we can educate others that are not necessarily from our backgrounds or our experience, again, as I had mentioned before, what this essence is, what this spirit is. So for me, it's all a question about intention and understanding that history, that fundamental, that foundation. Has it been done well? Absolutely. These are expressions that are ancestral for, for Bomba, it's over 500, 400 years old. And the fact that we're standing here today and still talking about it and teaching people, yes, absolutely, it's been done well. A face like, um, uh, police brutality, uh, laws that have put us down, uh, people taking away our drums, people asking us to dress up a certain way so that we look a certain way to make it more palatable for people to do our music. Uh-uh, we are still here. We're still here, we're still doing it. Is it a learning process? Absolutely. We will, will we continue, continue to grow? Absolutely. But we are still adamant and intentional about moving forward, right? I think what's been really interesting to hear when Kojo was sharing and Maria Isa was sharing is that as practitioners, we are also educators. And that is the key to be able to ensure that these traditions, these expressions, this spirit, this in intentionality goes to another place that doesn't stick just within us. It has to be transmitted to an other, to a child, to a community, right? And that is, that is so much more powerful than performing, even though performing does have its, its place. Um, you know, <laughs> again, there's so much more that can be said, and I feel like I need to stop and write down all my thoughts because, you know, when we start talking, we're like, oh, and this and that and this and that and no. But especially um, in these times of, of quarantine and COVID, you know, uh, one of the first things that kind of struck to mind is like, oh my God, how are we gonna do this if we can't be with our brothers and sisters? We can't be, we can't go to the corner and play or perform. And practice is in your heart, you know? And, um, you know, as Maria Isa said, we call each other, we do our little chats, you know, on the side, we post and share information what our other peers are doing around the world. Like that is part of practice as well. Julio, are you finished? Yes. I, I just want to say one more little comment too about just the beautiful fact there's, there's a lot of synergy that, that the viewers might not even even be aware of right here on this panel. Just, um, and, and I just wanted to speak to the idea that in times of adversity, like now, 
uh, hardship, oppression, it, the, how these walls break down between these perceived cultural barriers. So, you know, you have bomberas side by side with capoeiristas fighting the same fight. Both of them tools, historic, historically been tools of resistance, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, you know, you see a lot of people coming together that previously might not have you know, been together at the same table in the same discussions and the same struggle. Uh, we've all been in the same struggle, but they realize it, I think, now we're in the same struggle. And uh, you know, to that effect, I even started a project, I'm never going to hear the end of it, I don't mention it, called Ritmo Resiliente, which brings Bomba from Puerto Rico and Capoeira Angola from Brazil to the people on the island of uh, Puerto Rico, uh, St. Croix, hopefully DC will, will, will have another iteration of the whole thing, but uh, really important how uh, on the ground, how these things come together and how we, we, you know, we, we put down these barriers, uh, or we cross these barriers, or and 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 these perceived cultural barriers and linguistic barriers, and, and we, you know, we, we're aligned, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just wanted to touch on that, just uh, how beautiful and power, powerful this is, how powerful this time is. Yeah. And maybe if we could uh, use that to springboard to uh, a different question that both we had originally planned and that I see surfacing up uh, from some of the audience. Um, if we think of shifting from art to culture, uh, if you will, as we were talking about in culture, not something as performance or even just practice, but culture is the DNA of a people. You know, it is that which makes you unique. Uh, and then we see, you, we've your, we used the word violence, colonialism, injustice, oppression. We could say these are all actions that violate inherent human dignity, you know, that which we naturally are. And that culture is how we are piecing ourselves back together. Um, it is the healing process uh, for a, a person and for uh, a village, a tribe, a people. Uh, then. In this moment across the nation, we see different headlines being used to describe what people are doing. We see there are mass protests happening across the country and across the globe. You know, we are seeing there are moments of rage. There are, quote, riots, uh, all these different terminologies. Uh, and we talked a little bit about this yesterday is that what we see is collective grief and grieving in public, if you will. Uh, and then with that, I think about um, while grief is not the sum of all healing, there is no healing without grief. Uh, and so maybe you could perhaps share a little bit about how does your practice and how does your specific engagement with culture, um, how does it help you grieve? Mm. <sighs> Oof. Yeah. Grieving. Yeah. <laughs> is heal okay it's you know being here and you know we're, we're, the world is saying george's name as they should everybody say all the names you know um i have to say another name today of ashley johnson a 29 year old woman whose body was found shot in her car last night after curfew black woman you know three blocks away from where I live, where I can't be at right now to protect my daughter, who is the joy. So the the process of, of, of grieving is, it's hard to grieve because I am a mother and I have my daughter and she, her form of communication right now is emotion. And me trying to just keep her to know happiness and joy as the emotions and not anger and crying and the frustration. I have to decompress all of that by finding a space near to those in my culture um, who are feeling the same way. Mothers that are black and brown mothers of newborns and infants and connecting through social media to make sure that we're okay and that our husbands are okay. As a woman, you know, you have to be, they always say the, the man is the household. Uh -uh, not mm -hmm. The woman has to make sure that 
everything is set forth so that the man can be the man, right? So that he feels um, safe and secured and not fall into the cycle and the chains. Like, you know, we're all trying to break the system before all this and now even more. And I find myself still yet not having enough time to grieve um, for George, for somebody that, you know, I knew to grieve. I mean, it's been four years since Phil got shot and killed in front of us. Philando Castile to y'all, but he's Phil to us, um, who offered free meals to our children in our Bomba en Plena summer groups. You know, so it's like the grieving has become uh, calloused, like the way that my hands feel. Um, and so the, the, from banging on drums since I was five, you know, the grieving for all of us is callous. So when you get calloused, you feel that, hey, what else pain can I, I, I can't feel. So I'm ready to do whatever it takes. And I'm feeling callous at 33. Y'all have been mentors to me through your work. Our children have calluses that are the calluses of destructions from militia and their countries that have migrated to make this their home. So the grieving process has been very difficult because we haven't had time to grieve and find closure in our healing. Mm -hmm. How are we doing it? Listening to our ancestors, mm -hmm. feeling them, praying to them, calling upon them to give us strength of our creator and the elements of this world to be healed amongst all of this destruction. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that um, as bomberos and as pleneros, whenever there is um, a grave injustice, you know, albeit on a worldwide level, a community level, or in your in your individual family home, one of the first things that we do to to kind of seek that sense of of reprieve and resolve through the grieving process is go to our drums, is go to our our music, to go to those bates, those ciphers that we create to be able to manifest ourselves um, as a dancer, because that's principally what I do within the bomba world. Um, it's a space for me to be able to shut off the mind and to let body and spirit speak. Because just as with grief, especially as the way that Maria was, was referencing it, you know, it's, it's not just George Floyd. It's not just what happened yesterday. It's, been, it's what's been going on for thousands of years that we carry within our bloodlines. And it's very hard for us to articulate that and even to perceive that, right? Um, when we shut this out and we let the heart and the spirit soar, that's when we can channel right? That energy, that essence, that release that we need. Because words are never, never just enough. So for us, for me, the grieving process, the space where we can also find a, a, a place to stand and to rise and to still get breath is through our drums, through our music, through our community. Hearing the songs that are written that capture these um, hidden truths that people don't tend to recognize all the time. And when we sing onto them, when we repeat those choruses, we give it new life. We recognize it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one of the a word that comes to mind is ritual, Mark, in answer to your question, uh, mm -hmm. listen to everybody talk. And certainly um, for those of us who are you know, practitioners of African spiritual systems, mm -hmm. you know, ritual plays a very important part in grieving and healing, you know, um, and even in reconciliation and, and putting the community back in balance, ritual is a very important part in which, you know, our, 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 all of our the, the, the cultural expressions we're talking about here today are ritualized. Capoeira is ritualized combat. It's not just naked aggression, it's ritualized combat. It's steeped in oral tradition is steeped in a historical kind of um, reenactment, kind of replaying the story, which oftentimes what ritual is. 
but it's 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 really about ritual, and that's what you know. For those of us who are part of African diaspora traditions, what happens when we grieve? We sing, we dance, we play. What happens when we're celebrating? We sing, mm -hmm. we dance, we play. When we're jubilating, okay. when uh, to celebrate mm -hmm. life, marriage, we sing, we dance, we play. So uh, uh, since I, I brought up Wheat Mother's evening for a reason, uh, uh, talking to my, my good friends, uh, Marian Torres and Melanie Melvin of the Yes, uh, we, we, we talked through this idea around, and I said, you know, culture is this vehicle, you know, and the way we handle our grief as, as Black people, the way we handle, this was after Hurricane Maria, you know, the way we handle these things, the way we confront these, the way we deal with them, the, we get, what has always gotten us through them is we sing, we dance, we play. And that's for you Christian folk too. You, you know, you go to a Black Baptist church on Sunday, they singing and dancing mm -hmm. and, and playing and playing the instruments. That's what that's what goes on. So that is at, at the heart of, of, of our resilience. That's what's at the heart of, of our survival, you understand? Mm -hmm. And that's how, uh, even in the face of insurmountable or uh, uh, seemingly insurmountable conditions, we always come through. Uh, we even thrive, and, and I think it mystifies and even terrifies uh, those who are, are so afraid of us and seem to hate us for no reason. This is much bigger <laughs> than George Floyd. This is much bigger than the Supreme Court. And I want to I want to also make a note like and all of that fuses into hip hop, which is 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 important to see the young brothers and sisters who are putting songs out from their phones and 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 don't have access to being around community because like myself, I, I have a, a chronic illness being a type one diabetic. I can't be amongst so large protesting because of the COVID and it is out there. And that's a whole other enemy that we're fighting, you know, amongst uh, uh, the health disparities in our black and Latinx communities. And, um, but being able to, to, to put the power to the pen and the power to the mic has been that's that that's been our medicine throughout you know like what you said is is george floyd and beyond you know so it, music is an international language and that is la medicina no puede curar todo pero si puede curar todo you know can you say that in english sorry <laughs> <laughs> she said it all. I know, right? <laughs> music can't heal everything, but you music can heal everything. And and yes, that's what it is. And yep. sorry, my Spanglish is is my my language. Oh. That's that's mm -hmm. where I come yeah. from too. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we got you. No, uh, one of the things one of the things I just like to elevate to the audience is um you know, grief comes out in many ways and that grief can be self-destructive at times, you know? And that it's also important to remember though, we don't yell at people that you're grieving wrong. Right. You know, we step in and acknowledge the pain and look at ways to move it forward. Uh, that is healing and transformative uh, instead of yelling at those who are hurting. Uh, and I think that's something that we all can hold up in this moment uh, where everyone wants to debate about what people should do uh, before acknowledging the pain. Um, with that, though, when we do get to the spaces acknowledgement, um, then there gets to the to where to from here, if you will. Uh, Aaron Dottie Roy uh, had an amazing article at the beginning of uh, the COVID crisis, which we're still in the middle of globally. Uh, that we just literally passed a hundred thousand deaths in the u.s about 10 days ago which mm -hmm. now doesn't even seem like the largest issue uh in mm -hmm. the country uh, but literally more people died from covid in two months than in the nearly 20 years under the vietnam war and that we know those who died were disproportionately elders black bodies and brown bodies and those who are previously called low skilled workers but now we understand are essential workers um and in the middle of all of that um aaron Dottie royce writes this article about the portal about the moment of globally we get this 
uh, great pause, quote unquote, where the earth is stopping and we see carbon footprints and emissions going down. Uh, we see that people are having a moment to actually lean into what matters and who matters and who do I sit with in this time? Uh, uh, when I, I may be able to lose anyone. Uh, and one of the things that I'm reminded of though is that a portal starts in one area and then it leads you to another. Yeah. And both you have to go through the portal uh, and then also you emerge somewhere from a portal. And I'm thinking about that other space because we've used in this conversation yesterday and again today this word resistance. Um, but linguistically and etymologically, resistance means the refusal of something. And I think about the people I sit with and I think about my children and, and I think about my loved ones and I want to do more than refuse for the, them. I want to do more than resist for them. I want to build a world for them. You know, and a, a world where they are affirmed, loved, embraced, and thrive. And I think about that. And so I want to know from you all, on the other end of the portal, you know, what does that world look like? The world after this moment, the world beyond resistance, you know, the world where uh, the things we've, we speak about have begun to or have fully emerged. Uh, if you could maybe spend a couple minutes, let's say two minutes each uh, to offer up that to the audience in the world in this moment. Uh, and then we'll close with uh, uh, comments from Julia. You, as, as a mother, I want my daughter to be, she's one years old. I want her to be five years old. I want her 10 years old, five years old. I need five years old to tell me, mommy, what, what were the, police what's the police and they were uh an army that killed people that look like my dad and you and our family members and what you know not, kids not even having to remember the injustices that we have faced as people of color and indigenous folks <laughs> amongst a war with police brutality and that's what we're fa we're we're it's beyond police brutality. This is systemic brutality, and um, that's what where, where I want to see the growth of resistance, resilience, revolutionary to to evolutionize into abolishing these systemic injustices and a whole clean limpia. Like we know how you feel <laughs> when you need to get your head right, right? that feeling of purity and and being able to breathe making sure that we don't hear those i can't breathe anymore because somebody is taking our breath away as much as we're here breathing the stuff make that i feel what i feel inside it's hard to breathe because <sighs> the reality of it all is that that's what it is. The law has has the ability to take away your breath and your life. And hopefully this is the moment where, Ja, Ja, we're not allowing our children to have to worry and be scared of the police, to be worried of a system that is going to take away their innocence and their breath. Uh, Mark, the, first of all, I love the imagery. Um, the, I like to speak and think in Proverbs. And um, one mm -hmm. of the, and, and, uh, I learned from Ghana, that's the uh, concept called Sankofa, which is basically go back into your past to retrieve something that's you know, useful for your present and your future. And I think, um, again, interestingly enough, we're all representing these traditional art forms that are brought forward from our antiquity. And if you, you've ever been in, uh, you know, in, in a traditional culture, if you've ever been, uh, you know, in, uh, in a village, let's say, be it in Africa, Asia, whatever, one thing you'll notice, there's, there's not a bunch of police maintaining order. You know, in traditional societies, you didn't have police roaming around, you know, bopping people over the head to maintain some kind of social order. People, social order was within people. 
it was it's within us. That sense of right and wrong is within us. So what I'd like to see is uh, let's let's dial it back to that where we do right to one another because it's right. Let's this in, in this future on the other end of that portal, you know, we we coexist with each other, and difference is a good thing. We learn and and we benefit from our differences. Be it uh, racial, ethnic, gender, you know. Um, we on the other end of your, this portal you're describing, you know, we will we'll listen to and respect our women. Do you understand? On the other end of this portal, we'll we'll within our groups, you know, uh, because really discuss point, you know, this colorism and anti-blackness within each of, you know, these cultures. We'll we'll you know we can unpack and deal with these those kind of things. Um, but uh, going back to what you said about even the way we express and respond to to uh, to this oppression, to things that you know, the way we the way people are, are, are protesting right now, you know, it, it's it's almost like they they issue out the hardship and then they dictate to you how you're supposed to respond to, you know, be tame, show up at this time, march on this route, and that's how you're allowed to express your your grief and your anger at how you're being treated. But in, in, in the future, like uh, you know, I agree with Julia, you know, there's, there's none of that. We, uh, real freedom is being able to live in this world on your own terms as yourself without having to assimilate someone else's accent, hairstyle, um, you know, without having to uh, wonder if you're gonna come home alive from a trip to the bank. You know, that's a whole nother story. You know, to your, wonder about your kids when they go to school, you know, um, there's a there's a post floating around. Somebody asks a kid, you know, small, you know, young black child, what do you want to be in the future? He says, alive. You know, we want our children to we want, to, we want our children to live to to fulfill their potential. So, you know, in this in this future portal, you know, a human beings expressing the height of their capacity and the height of their potential should be our concern, not, you know, how do we keep one person in, at the bottom or keep some people in the bottom or how do we avoid uh, being utterly destroyed by one small minority of people, actually. You know, how do we, you know, and, and how do we bring this into, we've got the tools to do that. We've, we've, we've seen the examples of it. Uh, and most of these cultures that have been all but annihilated, you know, I know my sister there is on uh, indigenous land uh, those of us come from an indigenous traditions, we've, we've gotten examples already. We've learned, we've been taught. Let's, let's go back to those lessons we learned. Uh, there's so many, there, there's so many in our antiquity. Let's go back and, and learn how to be civilized again and human. Mm. Thank you. And then I want to add one thing before I pass over to Julia, both for her answer and for the closing uh, remarks. Um, one of the things, you know, to just uh, lift up again that you mentioned, Kojo, was uh, we've outsourced social order. Uh, yeah. And I think that's something really powerful to think about when we think about individual agency and, individ and inherent dignity um, and how to bring that back, to reclaim, to recenter, to recalibrate that. Um, but to also lift stuff, we've outsourced it in a time where we have both disposable plastic and disposable people, mm. <laughs> where we've siloed generations, uh, where the, we are asked to imagine a future and how bold we can imagine is a future where our children live. You know, And for some people that I think would be just the base you know, not even a bold, but just there's a future where my children can live. Um, I did want to lift up one statistic, I think, uh, that uh, Maria, when you had mentioned, you know, our children and the calluses they carry, you know, so much like ours. Um, I also want to remind us all that our elders also carry many calluses. And I think that in some ways we, we've siloed our elders and, and we've uh, sidelined them. Uh, and that uh, I do wish in this time where we, the world feared that in 24 months, we may lose half of the world's elders. Like that was a legitimate fear. 
that maybe we can lift up a time to say that our elders deserve softness as well. Yeah. And maybe yeah. if we can offer them that, um, they can be the ones who then weave it back to the children. Um, and so I'll leave it at that. And then uh, last, uh, both answers and uh, remarks for Julia. Sorry, I keep muting me. Uh, there's a lot of tension that's happening. <laughs> so if I forget to unmute and mute, but um, our elders are definitely callous. Having that conversation with my mom, who's with me and feeling defeated amongst themselves because they've put themselves at the line and they've lost so many of their brothers and sisters in the movement and they've sacrificed so much. Like these buildings around us at our cultural centers were funded by our people selling tamales, you know, fried bread tacos, soul food sundaes, pasteles, you know, to now seeing places like McGizzy, the Native American Arts Center right in the heart of, of next to the precinct, you know, being burnt down. Uh, our elders are feeling that they're weeping just as much as the ancestors crossing the middle passageway when the blues note was created because the blues note was created by the weeping of feeling scared feeling how are we where we can't be defeated and feeling where do we survive so it's even beyond just the calluses it's 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 ptsd um and it's it's a it's it's a hatred that's coming out as well like there's there's like how do you cure the hate because they're killing black people <laughs> there there's native american women missing on our blocks and and black women being killed and no one's talking about that no one's talking about that and they're saying we're investigating it well the hood doesn't need to investigate the bodies don't need to investigate we know what's happening because we're 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 scared we're in danger um and we have lost our spaces but we have we haven't lost the soul of those spaces because mm -hmm. we know how to rebuild. Mm -hmm. And our elders are teaching us that even amongst their co own confusion is we've rebuilt. So now te toca ti, it's on you guys. Yeah. Huh. Um, I feel like I have to take a deep breath um, at this moment. Um, because it's it's quite apparent that there's a lot of energy that we're both feeling and that we're we're both you know recept receiving at this moment. Um, to to I guess answer or try to answer your question. I mean, the three of y'all have touched on a lot of things that you know I've been thinking about, and I think it's just clear that we share same same wavelengths. I think. What I would like to add to, to that is if we can start also expanding just that thought of, a, of that spectrum um, to really live by the, by the truth of a circle, right? Um, many of our traditions, of our practices are, are cemented on this idea of a cipher, of a circle of inclusivity, um, where it's an equal playing ground. Everybody's voice is there. And I don't, I don't mean to say like, you know, uh, to try to sugarcoat or, or think about the future in rose colored glasses, because that's not the intention at all, is, is, is essentially to say, yeah, you know, we're all present. And to, to try to get to a place where if we have to ex explain who we are, it is not in the, in the intention of having to justify who we are, simply, simply to celebrate the differences and the beauty from which we come from, right? Because we all have a place in that circle. We all have a place in that circle. Um, we can keep going. Um, I'm sure there's questions and comments um, that are being shared by the audience. Um, but if not, you know, we can probably all take a deep breath. Can we all take a deep breath together?
recognize that breath always. It's a privilege, it's a blessing. So as we close today, um, I just wanna make sure that we all know that this is the close of today's conversation, but it's, it's just a pause for ongoing discussions, dialogue, reflection that we all will continue to have either as a group or individually, internally within ourselves. Speak that truth, name those names, always reflect, always talk, always, every day, every day, like that ritual that Kojo was talking about earlier today. Um, I would definitely like to thank the voices that were present here today. Maria Isa, Kojo, Mark, the voices of the ancestors that have been speaking through us. Also definitely would like to thank everyone that's logged on, watched, listened, commented. We felt you. Um, we'll definitely be on those spaces again. Um, would like to give a special thanks to the team that made this discussion possible. It takes a village, y'all. It takes a whole crew of people. Um, um, just, but let's, let me name some of these names. Uh, shout out to Cristina Diaz Carrera, Amalia Cordoa, Sojin Kim, Sabrina Lynn Motley, and the production crew, Elisa Huff, Sarah Rothman, Zion Nutting, Alex Tagger, and Jenny Maycock that have been holding it down behind the scenes. Um, again, we hope that this discussion has offered a seed of inspiration and a reminder of what our voices, our intention, spirits, and bodies can represent and what they can do. Whether it is on our own or together in collective movement, we have the source of amazing empowerment and liberation and never forget that. We hope we can all be part of this ongoing conversation together on Facebook, Instagram, or simply knock on our doors and we'll open and we'll talk. Be safe, stay strong, thrive in resilience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Palante, siempre. Siempre. We stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. Ache. Ache. Amen.